All right, good morning, Christ Community Church. It is so good to see you uh, this beautiful Lord's Day. Uh, a couple of things to know about. Uh, first of all, if you would like to have our bulletin full of all of our upcoming events and also financial information, you can text the number 94000 and text the word bulletin to it. Uh, I think there's also an upcoming youth event. The youth are going to go out and float down. Belton Creek by the Gin sometime soon. That's in there. Uh, also in there are things like the upcoming women's ministry events, men's ministry events, things of that nature. Uh, but we welcome you to find that bulletin there. Also, today is our fifth Sunday service. So whenever there's five Sundays in a, su- in a month, we have what's called fifth Sundays, gather worship together. So all of our lobby class students, the students that typically go to the lobby class are going to be in the service with us today. So if you're one of those students, we are so glad that you're worshiping with us. You're always welcome in here. Uh, that's a, <clears throat> But we, we are so glad you're here. Uh, so no adults. This is our, our day with the kids in here. And so we're, we're so glad. All right. Also, women's ministry events this Wednesday. This Wednesday is our first women's ministry Bible study that's going to happen Wednesday evening at the church house. I know you're saying the church house is a construction site, so it's not actually in the building. They found a nice flat spot behind the building where we'll circle up some chairs. We'll have the cottage back there for bathroom access. Uh, So talk with Lindsay if you need to figure out child care. Uh, talk with Lindsay if you need other information about it whatsoever. Uh, and that's going to be this Wednesday from 7 to 9 p.m. Men, we're also going to be meeting this summer. A couple men's breakfasts, but also some work days and a cookout. Uh, so mark those in your calendars. One of the reasons we do these Bible studies in the summer and these events in the summer is because our community groups are on break. And being a part of a church means we need to know people in the church build relationships, have shared experiences, and so we invite you to join us in these. All right, also uh, a little update on the construction across the street. Um, I almost feel, I was was telling Lindsay this week, I said, I really feel like dominoes are starting to fall. Uh, We have a long ways to go, but I feel like things are moving more quickly now, and it's just a few big hurdles that we have to jump in order to get in there and start worshiping. If I were to guess, I'd say a month and a half maybe before we're worshiping over there. Uh, But I've been wrong, as you know, about timing many, many times. Uh, But we are are currently raising funds uh, for the finished work of furnishing the house, doing some playgrounds, doing some fence around playgrounds, things of that nature. Uh, We originally set a goal at at $26,000. I think we are at... $32,000, Thirty-two, almost thirty-three thousand dollars. So, thank you for your generosity on that. We're still receiving money for that. So, if you want to donate, you can donate through our online giving platform, uh, and all that money will go towards that that finish work. Uh, the more we have, the more we'll be able to do, uh, and not have to wait another year or two of just uh, our normal normal building up of funds to pay for things. 
All right, Christ Community Church, let us stand for our call to worship. Psalm 73, verses 25 through 26. Who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. out the 
Have a seat. Because the love of our God is strong, we know that we can go to him with all of our sins, with all of our sorrows, with all of our shortcomings. So this time in our service, this time of confession is when we're trusting in that strong love of God to find forgiveness, knowing that the forgiveness is always there in Christ. But we're also reminded in Scripture of the seriousness of of sin. As we look at Psalm 73, verse 27, 
And the psalmist says this, those far from you will certainly perish and that you destroy all those who are unfaithful to you. Christ Community Church, this is a seriousness of sin. So let us go to God right now in confession, confession confessing our sin silently to God. Read that verse again. Psalm seventy three twenty seven. Those far from you will certainly perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But the psalmist continues in verse twenty eight. But as for me, God's presence is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge. Heavenly Father, you are our refuge. Your presence in our life is good because through Christ Jesus, we are not far from you, but you have invited us into your family. You have put your name upon us. So, Father, we confess our sin to you, knowing that as our Father, knowing that your name is already upon us, that in Christ we have your forgiveness. And so we rejoice in that forgiveness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ Community Church, remember that when we are in Christ, our sins are forgiven. They are not counted against us. That knowledge of our sins no longer being counted against us leads us into this new moment of worship that we have in our service where we come to the Lord's Supper table together. The Lord's Supper is a ceremony we do on a weekly basis, and it is for God's people. So if you are a follower of Christ, it doesn't matter if you're a covenant member at Christ Community Church or you're a member of another church. If you are in Christ, you are welcome to participate in this meal with us. However, if you don't know Christ, we would ask that you let these elements pass you by uh, because these elements, by taking them, you're saying, I'm trusting in Christ for the forgiveness of my sins. So if that's not a commitment that you've made, we just ask that you let these elements pass you by. Uh, we'll ask you if you'd like to participate, and if you don't, just say, not today, Pastor, and we'll pray a prayer of blessing over you. Uh, we are so glad that you're in our church services today. But if you are count yourself a believer, if you count yourself a follower of Christ, and you are not living in repentance, that you have sin, you know you have sin, and you long for your sin more than you long for Christ, we ask that you let these elements pass you by because it is signed that Psalm 73, 27 might be true of you, that those who are far from God will certainly perish because you destroy all who are unfaithful to you. So let us go to God in repentance of our sins, trusting in his work. On the night that Christ was betrayed, he was with the disciples in the upper room. He took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, then Christ took the cup, and he said, this cup represents my blood, blood of a new covenant, blood which is shed for the forgiveness of many sins. Christ Community Church, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim Christ's death until he comes again. So this morning, you are all evangelists of one another, reminding each other of the bond you have in Christ, reminding each other of whose name is upon us. So let us eat and drink with thanksgiving.
If you would please stand for the reading of God's word. Ralph, I want to have you operate this just during the reading, and then I'll take it back from you. All right, thank you, sir. Today, our passage is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 12 through 26. During those days, he, Jesus, went out to the mountain to pray and spent all night in prayer to God. When daylight came, he summoned his disciples, and he chose 12 of them, whom he also named apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. After coming down with them, he stood on a level place with a large crowd of his disciples and a great number of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. They came near to him, and and they came near to him to be healed of their diseases, and those tormented by unclean spirits were made well. The whole crowd was trying to touch him because power was coming out from him, healing them all. Then, looking up at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, because the kingdom of God is yours. Blessed are you who are now hungry, because you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, because you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, when they insult you and slander your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Take note, your reward is great in heaven, for this is the way their ancestors used to treat the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your comfort. Woe to you who are now full, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are now laughing, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when people speak well of you, for this is the way their ancestors used to treat the false prophets. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 12 through 26. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I know today is Memorial Day, and I meant to mention that in our announcements, and I don't want it to go by without mention. I know today is a day that's difficult for many of you because you have friends, um, brothers and sisters in arms that might have uh, perished in the fight for freedom. Uh, So so know that our thoughts and prayers are with you. Um, And I think this passage has some appropriateness to it for this day Because blessed are those who weep, for you will be comforted. The hope that we have in Christ brings us comfort uh, for that which has been lost, for that which has been withheld. Uh, So our thoughts and prayers are with you. Let's pray right quick before our service, our sermon begins. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that your spirit would have his good work done in our hearts and in our minds, teaching us and instructing us in your word. Father, help us to be true to this text. Help us to look at our lives and evaluate it according to what you have said. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we find ourselves in this passage where we're talking about the Sermon on the Mount. Typically when we think of the Sermon on the Mount, we think of Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. This is Luke's version, and it's, it's a bit different. More than likely... Jesus, as a traveling teacher and rabbi, had many sermons that he used, and they had some variation from time to time And when he gave it, and that's the reason for the variation. And just like any speaker, whenever he is in a particular group of people, he is going to form and customize that talk for the people that, that he's with. And so that's the reason for the variation here. Early in this text that we read today, Jesus called out, 12 of his disciples, and he made them apostles. And then we are told that whenever he began to teach, he began to teach specifically to his apostles and his disciples. And what Jesus was talking about and what he was teaching on is he was teaching on the kingdom of heaven. 
What does it look like to be a disciple of Jesus and to strive and live for the kingdom of heaven? So children's church is not happening today. We don't have the lobby class going on. But if you are in children's church in the lobby class, you probably recognize this picture. This is a picture that they've been using downstairs to talk about the kingdom of heaven. So this is a picture of a castle. Uh, it still has the ink print on it like, the, like, the, like we stole this picture. I'll have to talk. No, just joking. All right, so this is a picture of, the, of a castle representing the kingdoms of this world. And what they've been talking about in children's church the last few weeks is that the kingdom of God doesn't look like this, but rather the kingdom of God looks like this. That the kingdom of God is oftentimes what theologians call an upside-down kingdom. Why is it? Why is it that the kingdom of God is considered to be an upside-down kingdom? The reason is, is because what the world lives for, what the world aims for, is directly opposed and opposite from that of the kingdom of God. So Jesus, in this Sermon on the Mount, he talks about three different things. He talks about wealth, he talks about weeping and mourning, and then he talks about uh, stature and acceptance. And what Jesus is saying is that his kingdom is an upside-down kingdom, that the way that the world looks at wealth is opposed to and opposite from the way the kingdom of God views wealth. He looks at weeping and mourning and desire and longing. He says the way that the world pursues desire and longing is different from the way that the kingdom of God desires and longs. That the way that the world views acceptance and stature is opposed to the way that the kingdom of God pursues acceptance and stature. It's an upside down kingdom. So we want to look at Jesus' blessings and his woes. Uh, Just like in Matthew when the word blessings is used, blessed is the man, he's saying how happy is the man. This person should be happy. And woes is like, whoa, look out. This is not good, right? We got to be careful here. So Jesus is going through these blessings and these woes, these these happiness and warnings that he is giving us. And so let's look at these three different blessings and woes. What does it look like to live in the kingdom of God, this upside down kingdom? This is written in a parallel structure in in Luke chapter 6. So we'll look at what it says about wealth, the blessings of wealth, then we'll go down to the woes of wealth. So if we look at Luke chapter 6, verse 20, this is what the Word of God says about wealth. Looking up at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, because the kingdom of God is yours. Now jump down to verse 24, the parallel woe. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your comfort. Whenever we look at these passages, one of the first things that we have to ask is, is Jesus being literal here or metaphorical? Is he meaning, blessed are you who are literally poor? Or like in Matthew, is he pointing more to like the spiritual realm of blessed are you who are poor in spirit? When we look at Luke, we see that Jesus's message has a different tone to it. And he's not talking about poverty and spirit here. But here in Luke chapter 6, he's literally speaking about money and wealth. And he's saying, blessed are you who are poor. We see that this is a theme that goes throughout all of Luke as well. So if you look look at Luke chapter 4, Jesus says that he has come anointed to preach the good news to the poor. And Luke chapter 12 We have the parable of the rich fool where Jesus is warning against people storing up treasures for themselves on this earth and not being rich towards God. In chapter 16, we have the rich man and Lazarus, this rich man without a name who has wealth and comfort on this earth. Lazarus, a poor man at his doorsteps, yet in death, Lazarus is comforted by Abraham and the rich man is separated from God by a great gulf. In Luke chapter 18, we have the story of the rich young ruler who had wealth, who had stature, and who left Jesus sad because he was not willing to give up his position. 
In chapter 19, we have the story of Zacchaeus, this man who was wealthy and who received salvation. And part of that was a sign of that was the fact that he was willing to give away his wealth. So we see in the book of Luke, there is this idea, this theme running throughout the entire book where wealth is warned against and a poverty of one's status is actually celebrated. What's the idea here? Why does the gospel of Luke do this? One, he does it because he is warning us that abundance in this life can mean apathy towards God. That the more you have in this life and the more comfort you have in this life, the more we can realize that we don't have a dependence on God. I have a friend of mine, her name's Natalie Rocco. She was in my youth ministry uh, at Grace Bible Church who planted us. And she is now living in Guatemala full time. She's an she's a English teacher. Uh, she works with a church. And she said one of the big differences between our cultures is that whenever someone in her village gets sick, you know what they do automatically? They just jump straight to prayer. They jump straight for prayers of healing. He says, but for me, she's like, I grew up. She's a daughter of an army chaplain. She said, I grew up with TRICARE. I grew up with insurance. I grew up with hospitals and this great system. And so my first reaction when someone gets sick is like, let's go to the hospital. She's like, even when I can drive someone to the hospital, even when we can raise the support to meet their medical procedure, she's like, they still want to say, no, let's, let's pray first. Why is that? Because they have lived a life in poverty. And in poverty, you cannot depend on these other systems. They don't have insurance to go to. So their life is one of dependence. Jesus is warning us that abundance in this life can lead us to apathy with God, where we neglect the kingdom of God. How do we apply these truths? I think the first thing we have to do is we have to confess and admit the obvious truth that we're all wealthy. Isn't that, isn't that the hard part here? Isn't this ironic that I'm teaching on the dangers of wealth to a room full of rich people? You might say, Stephen, I'm not rich. My neighbor's rich. The guy down the road is rich. I'm not rich. But when you look at the history of the world, we have to admit, man, we are some of the wealthiest people who have ever lived on the face of the earth. This is how I explain it to my kids. I say, kids, y'all don't realize that we live in the Watson house. We live better than kings. And parents, you can feel free to steal this one. I think this is a fun one. I say, we live better than kings. King Solomon, richest, wisest person in the history of the world. We are richer than King Solomon. And they say, well, how's that, dad? I'm like, King Solomon did not have an H-E-B. Man had to like have other people raise food for him. He didn't have an H-E-B. King Solomon didn't have central heat and air. Dude lived in the Middle East without heat and air. King Solomon didn't have the technology of iPhones and televisions. King Solomon, his fastest chariot was slower than my 2008 Nissan Sentra with 200,000 miles. I could drive circles around that man. Are we wealthy? Are we rich? Of course we are. And, and there's nothing wrong and there's nothing evil in itself with money, is it? Money, money is a tool. You can take a hammer and you can build a hospital because it's a tool. Or you can take a hammer and you can build a brothel. It's a tool. The question is, is how do you use the wealth? How do you use the money that God has given us? And we have to realize, as wealthy people, we have to realize the dangers of the wealth that we have. Think about it this way. Jesus, when he was speaking to the rich young ruler, and Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, then sell all that you have and follow me. He didn't ask this of all the people who followed him, but this, this guy in particular whose love was money, he asked him to do it. And Jesus said that the man walked away sad, and he turned to his disciples and he said this, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's easier 
for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for any of us to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why is that? It's because oftentimes we put our comfort, we put our hope, we put our security in our bank accounts or in our jobs that bring us money. So we need to learn how to use our wealth as a good tool. The Apostle Paul, writing his protege Timothy, wrote this in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. should write this reference down. It's such a good reference in regards to money. This is what Paul wrote. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and we can take nothing out. If we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. Is that not like convicting right there? Because how often do I get a little down? I think, hmm, I was looking at this on Amazon. Let me go and order it so I can have it in two days. He's saying, if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from these things and pursue righteousness and godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Did you hear what Paul said about wealth and the love of money? He said that the pursuit of the love of money leads us into temptation and it plunges us into ruin and destruction. I teach Bible at, at a school in Belton, and I, I always set them up for this, this trap every, every year I teach them. I get a new class every semester, so I do this with all of them. And I say, all right, who here, before we discuss passages like this, I say, all right, who here wants to be rich? You know how many hands go up? Every one of them. Every one of them. Because you know what? Everybody wants to be rich. We want wealth. And then I say, all right, students, you want to be rich. Look at what it says in the Bible, that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. All right, who here still wants to be rich? You know, they still all raise their hands. They're like, it's a risk I'm willing to take, right? And we laugh at that because we know it's true not only of, of my ninth and 10th graders, but we know it's true in our own hearts as well. Jesus is saying, blessed are you when you're poor, when you don't even have that option because your only hope is in God. Your only hope is in God. Paul continues in his talk with Timothy about how the rich should approach their wealth. So since I'm speaking to a room of wealthy people, how do we handle our wealth? Paul in 1 Timothy 6 continues in verses 17 through 19. He says this. He's so kind, like laying this out for us. He says, instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant, not to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share, storing up for themselves a treasure as a good foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of what is truly life. So if we are wealthy, what does Paul instruct us? He says, don't put your hope in money. Don't put your confidence and your security in money, but rather be rich in good works and be rather than being rich in money. He said, be generous and willing to share with other people. I think this is just wisdom. But as you are budgeting, as you look at your budget, we have to say, all right, I need to make sure that I am living below my means. Because oftentimes what happens is we make this much money and then we spend this much money. And we live our lives in debt to other people 
and we're always trying to play catch up to make more money to pay that difference. But when we make more money, we just spend more money. And so we are, we're running a race that we can never win. But I think what wisdom would say is if you make this much money, why don't we spend this much money? And you say, well, why? Well, one, it's wisdom. Two, Paul is saying that those people who are wealthy, all of us, we need to make sure that we are people who are willing to share. If you are living beyond your means, whenever your brother or sister in Christ comes up short and they're not able to pay their, their car payment, or maybe they're not able to pay their electric bill, are you going to be ready and able to help them out? Or you're like, man, I sure wish I could help you out, but I make this much money and I spend this much money. We need to make sure that we are people who look strategically at our budget and says, man, I want to budget into my budget room to share. You should have part of your budget said, this is where I help other people out. And I'm not even talking about giving to the church here. I'm just talking about showing kindness with other people with what God has given you. Now, what do we teach at our church about giving to the church? Some churches say, well, you should give 10% and that's a tithe. We don't really do that here, um, partly because if you were to follow the Old Testament and the laws in the Old Testament where it talks about tithing, they actually tithe more around 23% and not 10% between all their gifts throughout the year. Um, But what we teach and what we try to teach is what the New Testament teaches, that everything that you have belongs to God. And everything that you have is to be spent on the kingdom of God. So whether you go to HEB or you go on a vacation, that's fine. But pursue that as you would the kingdom of God. So what about giving to the church? What do we teach? This is what we teach. We try and say, well, what does the New Testament teach us about giving? Well, we think that the New Testament talks about giving as something that should be regular. That it might not be 10%, it might be 1%, it might be 20%. We don't care about that as much as that your giving is regular. Because whenever we turn to the New Testament, Paul said, on the Lord's day, set aside funds. So there's this idea that we give on a regular basis. We talk about how giving should not be under compulsion. That you shouldn't feel guilty towards giving like, well, I guess I got to do this. But the New Testament, in fact, Jesus said that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. So not only should giving be regularly, but it should be done without compulsion, and it should be done cheerfully. And finally, that it should be done generously. Like I said, it's not about a number amount, but it's about the spirit and the heart of the one who gives it. The widow Jesus saw at the temple giving money, she put in just two small coins into the offering box. And then you had all these other wealthy people making a show of their large donations. And Jesus said, I I want what the widow gave. Because these guys over here, they gave out of their abundance and it meant nothing to them but stature. But she gave out of devotion and love and she gave all that she had. So Christ Community Church, let us have this upside down kingdom type of attitude in regards to our wealth. Make sure that we are generous with people who are in need, helping them. Make sure we, we, we budget that in to what the Lord has blessed us with. What about the next one? This idea of desire and longing. Look at Luke chapter 6, verse 21. Blessed are you who are hungry now, because you will be filled Blessed are you who weep now, because you will laugh. Then we go down to the the parallel woe in in verse 25. Woe to you who are now full, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are now laughing, for you will mourn and you will weep. From these verses, how do we get to this idea of desire and longing? What is the hunger in our belly but a desire to have our stomachs filled? What is weeping but a longing and a desire to have that which was lost or withheld from us? Jesus is saying 
that blessed or happy is the person who puts their hope in something beyond their immediate desire, that they put their desire in his kingdom and his son and his redemption and his restoration of the things lost or withheld in this world. This is an upside down kingdom. It's an upside down kingdom because that's not what the world teaches. The world teaches that our longings and our desires define us and that we pursue our longings and our desires more than anything else. You ever, you ever uh, Google what you Google? You ever done that? My, my wife and I were doing this last night. Uh, the kids were in bed and, and I said, honey, like, what's the last thing you Googled? And so she went and she like went to google.com. Like you can actually go to their website and not just type it in the URL. And you can click on the search button and it drops down your last things you Googled. And it, it, she's such a nerd. She was like, oh, I Googled how to translate this in Latin. I'm like, all right, it's great. I think mine was something like, like how high is a volleyball net or something like that. Um, but you can type different things in Google and it will answer it for you. So you think of the common statement about, uh, this idea of follow your dreams, right? You, you've heard that. Teachers tell kids that. Follow your dreams. Parents tell kids that. If you Google, what does it mean to follow your dreams? This is what Google will say. Follow your dreams and you will be happy. A very powerful message. Your dream gives you a sense of meaning and purpose and drives you into your chosen future. Your dream is the meaning of your life. Get your dreams off the shelf. Well, thanks, Google. But isn't that the idea that whenever we say that common phrase of follow your dreams, we're saying that your dream is what is most important in this life, that your longings and your desires are at the pinnacle of what your life is about. They give you meaning. They give you purpose. What about the common statement? Well, you can be anything you want to be. You Google that. What does it mean? It's a very long statement. I'm not going to read it, but this is where it begins. You can be anything you want to be, and this is where it ends. It is our moral obligation to be what we want to be. The world puts our desires and our longings more important than anything else. And as Christians, we live in this upside down kingdom where we say it's not our will, O oh God, but yours. May that be done. We pursue the kingdom of God. Look at the, what the woe says in verse 25, chapter 6, verse 25. He says, woe to you who are now full, for you will be comfort, or you will be hungry. Woe to you who are now laughing because you will weep and you will mourn. Jesus is warning us that if we pursue our dreams and our desires and our longings, there's this danger that you might actually get it. Isn't that strange? The danger of pursuing your dreams and your longings and your desires, the danger is that you might be successful. And Jesus is saying that if you are successful, that is your comfort. He says this upside down kingdom, we die to ourselves daily to pursue that which God has for us. I think we can look at the patriarchs. We can look at Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We can even look at Moses and the great heroes of old in the Old Testament. Hebrews talks about them, and this is what it says about these guys. All these people, Abraham, Moses, they all died in faith, although they had not received the things that were promised, but they saw them from a distance. They greeted them and confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on earth. Did you hear that? Abraham, the father of our faith, had this promise from God. Your children are going to be uncountable. This land you're walking on is going to be your kingdom. And Abraham died believing that, but never receiving that. And God said that that is faith. 
that he was holding on to something and believing to something that he could only see in the future. And that's what it is to be a Christian, that what we hope for, our consolation, our comfort, our peace, is what Christ will bring in his kingdom. We taste it here in this life, but we hope for it in its fullness in the future. My question for you is, what are you aiming for? What are you aiming for in this life? I don't know if you're... I don't know who taught you to shoot. My, my dad taught me to shoot, so we'll blame my, my bad aim on him. But one of the things that he always taught me when trying to teach me how to shoot a gun, he's like, Stephen, don't point a gun at anything you don't want to shoot. Like, if, if you don't want to kill it, don't point at it. And so we have to ask ourselves the question is, what are you aiming at in this life? Is it a, a, a position? Is it a... It is, is it a a station in life. It is an achievement in life. Is that what you are aiming at? Because when you aim at it, that's what you're trying to hit. And Jesus is saying that we need to adjust our sights. We need to adjust our aim. And instead of aiming at what the world says is success and what the world says is good, we need to aim at the kingdom of God. We need to spend our lives on his kingdom. Why? We might mourn we might weep we might be hungry but we have faith that we'll one day be filled in christ what are you aiming at and finally this idea of stature or acceptance let's look at the blessing let's look at what happy people look like in luke chapter 6 verse 22 blessed are you when people hate you when they exclude you when they insult you and slander your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Take note, your reward is great in heaven, for this is the way their ancestors used to treat the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your comfort. Woe to you who are now full. Uh, I'm sorry, (laughs) let's jump down to verse 26. Woe to you when people speak well of you, For this is the way their ancestors used to treat the false prophets. So Jesus is saying that you are blessed and you are happy when people hate you, exclude you, insult you, and slander you because of Jesus. My kids believe in Jesus. If you were to ask me, Stephen, do you think they're Christians? Like, of course they are. They believe in Christ. They believe that Jesus died for their sins. We pray together. We read God's word together. And I look at their lives. I'm like, yeah, I think they're Christians, but I haven't baptized any of them yet. And sometimes people say, Stephen, why haven't you baptized your kids yet? And part of the reasons I haven't is because of verses 22 and 23. Blessed are you when people hate you, exclude you, insult you, and slander you because of me. I I want my kids, before they are baptized, in Christ, I want them to be able to look at that cost and maybe even taste that cost just a little bit before they say, yes, I want to follow Jesus. Because they need to know that following Christ means to be hated by the world. But my kids, they live in this beautiful little bubble, and it's a great bubble. I I wish all children had this bubble. They have this bubble where they're in a home where their parents love Jesus. They, they have this context at school where their teachers love Jesus and they teach the God's word and they teach the gospel. They, they have this church where the people in their lives in this community love Jesus. And so they think that loving Jesus and following Jesus is normal. And what they don't know, that as soon as they step outside of that bubble, that what they're going to receive is hate, exclusion, insults and slander because of Christ. But Jesus is saying, that's the cost of following me. And blessed are you if that's where you are, because that's how they treated God's messengers, the prophets before them. Book of Hebrews 11 that we read earlier, they continue on and they describe God's people and they describe the prophets and their experiences. And this is what they experienced. Others experienced mockings and scourgings as well as bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. 
They died by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and on mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. Jesus is saying, this is the fate of the people who follow me. That you'll be hated by the world. And you say, Stephen, you're, you're great at convincing us to follow Christ. Goodness. But we also know that in Christ, it's the only way that we can have the forgiveness of our sins. That in Christ, it's the only way that our relationship with God the Father can be mended. It's the only way that we know that there is a kingdom beyond what we experience on this earth that will bring us true contentment, true peace. And that's the kingdom that we want to be a part of. We need to know as God's people, and, this, and I think this is very true of us today, because to some extent we've been living in this bubble, like not just our kids, but adults too, this bubble where Christ is glorified, but that's not the case anymore. We need to know, and this is how we can apply this passage today, we need to know that whenever we pursue Christ, whenever we are obedient to the scriptures, and we're trying to be peaceful, loving, kind, and gentle people, that the world will exclude us, hate us, and slander us. And this is the danger that I think that we fall into. I think many Christians today think that they can appease the world, that they can make the world happy, that we can come close enough to the world and speak well of the things that they hold as most important, and we can speak of it such a way that they accept us, but we can hold on to our values. But the truth of the matter is that the world despises our values. And there is no appeasing the world. I think about my alma mater most recently. I, uh, I went to Baylor, and Baylor just recently released this new policy they have. They said, we're going to keep our biblical stance on marriage and sexuality, but at the same time, we want to reach out to the LGBTQ community. And so we are going to start chartering organizations under our name that support that agenda. In fact, if these students want to go to church, here's a list of not just welcoming churches, but affirming churches. And I look at what my alma mater did. I'm like, what are you doing? Like on one hand, you're saying this is what's good and beautiful. But on the other hand, you're saying we want to embrace and accept this as well. And this is what happens whenever we try to meet the world halfway and compromise what we believe in. It's never going to be enough. It's never going to be enough. I guarantee you. In fact, I already saw it happen that as soon as Baylor did that, on one hand, they got these accolades of look how good they are. Look what they've done. And on the other hand, people from the LGBT community said it's about time and it's not enough. And it's never going to be enough until we lay all of our values down. So know this, brothers and sisters, when we hold to our values, when we hold to Scripture, when we hold to Christ and his upside-down kingdom, we will be hated, excluded, and insulted and slandered because of Christ. But make sure it's because of Christ. Don't claim that hate and exclusion and insult and slander if you're a jerk or or if you're lazy, like that's not being persecuted for Christ. That's because you are arrogant. But let it be because of Christ. What this means is that we need to make sure that we are obedient to the Word of God. We need to make sure that we are people who are kind, who are generous, who are loving. And we hold to our values with that stance so that when we are hated and excluded and slandered, we know what it's for. Jesus' warning says, Woe to you when people speak well of you, for this is the way their ancestors used to treat the false prophets. I want to end with this idea. It's a hard passage. What would a person look like if they followed Jesus' blessings? I do not think they would be a cantankerous person, I do not think that they would be a combative person. They would not be a hardened and angry person. 
But the person that Jesus describes here is one who is loving, who is hopeful, who is kind and generous and inviting people to follow Christ. These are the types of people we are supposed to be, and these are the values that we are supposed to have. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us. Help us to be the type of disciples that you called your disciples to be. People who pursue, who long for your kingdom above the kingdom of this world. Help us to be people who are generous. Help us be people whose longing and desires is that of you and your kingdom. Help us to be people who are not concerned with our stature and our standing with the world, but rather people who are willing to be reviled because of your name. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displays. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration
my Savior God to be. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou All right, Christ Community Church, let's remain standing for our benediction. Brothers and sisters in Christ, set your sights on the kingdom of God. Spending your wealth, your longings, your desire, your stature and standing on him and his kingdom, and you will be blessed. You're dismissed. <laughs>